găsit, eu sunt Radu Mihalache și astăzi am o invitată foarte specială în cadrul interviurilor Festivalului de Muzică Veche București. Dacă ar fi să e număr tot CV-ul, am umple bună parte din interviu, dar vă spun doar că este director artistic al Orchestrei Baroce Uniunii Europene, este unul dintre cei patru lideri ai Orchestrei The Age of Enlightenment și profesoară și șef de departament la Royal College of Music din Londra, Cambridge și multe alte locuri. Margaret Faultless, Faultless is a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Uh, I would like to start with you at your musical beginning. What was the moment uh, when you said, well, this is what I want to do, I want to make music? Well, I have been playing the violin and other instruments for extremely long time now. Um, but to be honest, I'm not sure that I had a light bulb moment. <laughs> It sort of evolved and music was just continually and ever more important in my life, both in my childhood, through some very important experiences with some other musicians where I grew up in Birmingham, um, playing some chamber orchestra repertoire in a very special way, actually in a way that f suits very well the historically informed performance movement, but I didn't really realize it at the time. Then I went to university and continued to be interested not just in the fact of playing, but in how the decision-making of playing evolves. And I found myself playing professionally, initially absolutely at the other end of the musical spectrum, but in contemporary music, working with composers, asking them exactly what they thought about how they wanted their music to be performed. And then curiously, I've ended up exploring the music of the past in a very particular way, asking those same questions, but of composers who are no longer with us today. I've always felt that uh, new music and old music, they go very well They do. Together. I think part of it is the, this quest for knowledge. On one hand, as you say, we've got composers that we can ask. On the other, we try and find the right questions and we find other ways of looking for the information inside the music itself, from accounts of music, from treatises, from theoreticians, from the technology, from the instruments themselves. There's all sorts of things that we can learn, but I think they do go together. Often, quite often, we're playing with smaller groups of people. So the aspect of the social interaction, social, intellectual and musical interaction between the players is absolutely crucial. And in something like working with the European Union Baroque Orchestra, with UBO, it's particularly fascinating because now it's not just me working with colleagues of my own age, but getting to know the next generation, discovering what they know about the music, discovering what they might not know, sharing ideas, um, and discovering new ways of performing. So the idea is not to replicate par past performances of what I've done, but to work with these new young players. And there's something new every time we get together. And because of the uniqueness of UBO being different every single year, it's always a challenge, it's always a pleasure, it's always an experience, and it's always a surprise to do a new program and a new concert with UBO. How did you start to work with uh, this orchestra in particular? Well, to be absolutely honest, I got a phone call uh, one day, very short notice, because somebody was ill. <laughs> and Paul rang and said, uh, how soon can you get to Germany? And I said, when do you want me? He said, yesterday. Uh, basically, uh, I got straight on the plane and came out to deputize for another English leader, concertmaster, um, to take part in a recording project with a very well-known German boys choir. Paul and I had known each other professionally through other, other ways. Anyway, he threw me in the deep end, and I have to admit that was over a quarter of a century ago. Uh, so it's a long and very happy union. Uh, I. I get to do something with the orchestra every year. I'm lucky enough to be one of the tutors, one of the professors who auditions the new orchestra. So in fact, I get to meet about 100 new European musicians every year, out of which, as Paul has probably described, 25, 20 or so get chosen for the orchestra. Uh, and then every two or three years, I direct a project like I'm doing this year. So you're part of the selection pro uh, process. Uh, you see people from different cultures, from different parts of the world. How is Baroque music seen in uh, all these European countries? Well, I think what's really fascinating is that there's something that binds us together through our various European languages, which we may not be able to understand um, so well when we're speaking. Uh, your English is brilliant. Um, Thank you. My Romanian, absolutely non-existent. Um, however, 
Once we're speaking a musical language, there is a lot of common ground in terms of the inflection of our European speech. And I think that's reflected in some aspects of a common European musical language. Of course there are differences. The French language is particular, the Italian musical language, then the German sort of high baroque, which brings both those together. Um, but nevertheless, as we've been talking um, just this week with a lot of new players, there is a lot of common ground in terms of a musical inflection of speech of words that have strong syllables and weak syllables, inflection that we can understand, and that's brought together uh, in a way that makes it really quite easy to play together and to understand and to discuss um, the music and how we're going to present it. So it's a very natural process. It's really quite a natural process. I think it is different with some other language groups from the Middle East and from the Far East, whose system of language and of grammar, syntax, linguistics is not quite the same. And it's interesting that we're doing, we're dealing essentially with a European musical language, and with Yubo, we're dealing with a European language heritage of speech as well. Um, I'm not saying that one can't combine other things. Uh, perfectly possible for you or me to learn to speak Japanese or Chinese, for example. And it's perfectly possible, as we know, that absolutely great Japanese and Chinese musicians. But it, it happens to be a certain syntax and grammar that I think works works very well. So it's a, it would be a longer process to, for them to assimilate? I suppose it depends on the individuals. <laughs> of course, yeah. of course. But culturally... It's different. It's a different process, yes. I think, certainly. Yeah. Uh, Hugh and Bucharest, you'll present us the birth of the orchestra. And when I say that, of course, I think of Jean-Baptiste Lully. Yes. What else should I think about? Well, I think you should think about Torelli, who's one of the composers in the concert, who had, who spotted that if you had a group of violins playing the same part together, they could be as loud and as dramatic as his famous trumpet players in the church for whom he wrote quite often. But you could ask, also ask them to do even more virtuosic things musically, uh, even more dramatic contrasts of dynamic, even more chromatic writing uh, right across the range, the tessitura of the instruments. So he had this idea of putting, make, of inviting more than one violinist to play each part. And that really is a crucial thing. Up to then, music had really just been played by a single person playing a single part. You're right, the same is happening in France with Lully and the Opera Orchestra. Um, Corelli, a little bit later in Rome, starts to have a flexibility whereby you can either play his material with a single player per part or put it together and have vast hordes of tutti players, all his students standing behind him in huge great rows in the theatre. Uh, Muffat, pupil of Corelli, who says we can either play this one to a part or if you're really lucky you can start, in, start to add other players. Um, Vivaldi actually possibly was still dealing with single single players to a part, but also in some contexts with more players. So we've grouped together this whole program at this time when Europe is evolving the idea of an orchestra being a bigger group of people, ostensibly where more than one person is playing the same line. That's the crucial, that's the crucial defining moment. And I think it's fascinating, uh, very interesting to think how the balance of players evolves, how we end up with big orchestras, quite small orchestras, but the crucial thing is more than one person playing each part. So we're looking at section playing and very different, fascinating social and musical interaction between the people involved. So the orchestra started in the 17th century. What happened with the conductor at the time? What did he do exactly? No idea of a silent conductor at that, at that point. Um, direction was usually through a combination of the concertmaster on the violinist and a keyboard player on the harpsichord. So there was nobody, there's no silent direction. Everybody who's involved in the process of directing the music or of playing is, is playing. The first person to stand up and really conduct an orchestra um, without playing was Louis Spohr, the famous violinist, who famously put down his violin and walked on stage one day with a baton. The orchestra didn't like it at all.
There were time beaters in opera houses occasionally and in churches for certain situations, but the idea of a, a conductor as the overriding hierarchical interpreter of the music is absolutely a 19th century tradition. So we're years and years away from that at this point in music history. But how do you say that Lully died beat, uh, keeping well, time? Well, sort of beating, yeah, but beating time very different from the idea of directing something in terms of an interpretation. That's the crucial thing. So the actual, the time beating is not a musical thing. It's a temporal thing. It's more like uh, the drummers on a boat. Exactly, that keep, uh, exactly, they keep the rowers going. Yeah, good analogy. Um, you, so I understand from this that you also prefer actively uh, leading your orchestra. I like to make a sound, yeah. <laughs> yes. In fact, I promised my husband that I would always use the violin when I was playing. Um, I'm very happy to talk, but I really feel that I like the responsibility. I like to have, to feel part of the group. Um, and it's great fun to play with people, to give them confidence, or for people to also realize that, you know, I'm human, but I like to play, yeah. You're part of many interesting groups. One of them is uh, the orchestra, the Age of Enlightenment. Yes. You're one of the leaders yes. over there. How did that project start? That project started with a whole group of London musicians uh, at the time when there was a lot of historical performance going on in the UK uh, and in Europe, of course. And in the UK, almost all um, historical performance activity was centered around certain individual directors, conductors actually, who formed their own ensembles. So you were, one was engaged as a performer to work for Christopher Hogwarts Orchestra, Sir Don Elliot Gardner's orchestra, Sir Roger Norrington's orchestra, Trevor Pinnock's orchestra, um, and so on. There were, of course, others as well. And the group of players got together and thought, well, this is all very well, very exciting, we're really lucky. But how about all these guys in Europe who've been pivotal to this movement getting underway? Gustav Lenhardt, Sigisfeld Koichen, Franz Bruggen, Tom Koopman. I mean, the list is, is large. And then the people in France, and then there might be some modern conductors who might be interested in working with old instruments. Simon Rattle, Mark Elder, Vladimir Yorovsky. And it turned out they all were, but there was no vehicle for that. So there was a bit of a moment, and a group of players got together and thought, ah, what happens if the orchestra, instead of being organized by the director, is organized by the players, then we can invite ex whomever we like to come and work with us. So that was the model of a player-run orchestra who make the artistic decisions about which conductors and directors to invite, and about which repertoire to play, and about which players play in the ensemble. And 30 years, 35 years on, it's still going. We now play music from Monteverdi to Mahler. In fact, we also play new commissions. I did a new commission only last week uh, in one of our famous pub gigs in London, uh, written for old instruments. But we play a big range of repertoire. The orchestra is very flexible. Some people play Monteverdi and Mahler. Uh, some people play more of the, the earlier end of the repertoire and others late. People have to play a great variety of instruments, a uh, huge variety of bows, variety of pitches, a uh, variety of the numbers of people who play. Some of our concerts, there are three people in the ensemble, and others, 103. Um, it's very exciting. But as you describe it, it's a very democratic uh, mentality. Um, I'm not sure democracy is quite the perfect word. It's a very complex organization. Yeah. It has management, it has a board, it has very clear financial directives. There, need to be, there needs to be people in charge for various sorts of activities. We don't, it's not that 100 people sit around making every single decision. And of, of course, course, not everybody likes every decision and it's an evolving organization. Um, but we, we elect various groups of people within the orchestra each year to make those decisions. Yes, I suppose that is, when it works, it's democracy in action on a good, in a good way. But as we know, democracy is a complicated animal. Yes, of course. But uh, either way, the orchestra is uh, setting itself apart from other ensembles. Yes, I think there are other player-led groups, of course. Um, there are a lot of self-governing orchestras uh, in England, the London Symphony Orchestra, for example. There are other chamber orchestras that are 
player-led and other period instrument orchestras now that are um, the law led uh, you know Ubo has a great variety of artistic directors it has a single management team has a totally flexible group of players um, an artistic director but a lot of different people come in to manage it it's it's fantastic that there are these different working models now and that the cultural world is open to invite different sorts of orchestras to give concerts you also um, take part of your time and uh, give it to preparing new musicians, to teaching. You're at the Royal Academy of Music in London. Uh, how, how do they, uh, let's say, start uh, with the Baroque violin? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Um, m I think it's a, probably true to say that very few people start learning historical instruments. They learn the more traditional um, violin, oboe, um, piano, whatever, um, and that's perfectly, absolutely as it should be. Uh, there are one or two exceptions of people who come along who have only played the historical instrument, and then seeing their development, trying out later and later instruments is absolutely fascinating. Um, it usually comes up that somebody has offers them an instrument to borrow for a particular project, or they might have a particular interest in repertoire, or have heard some concerts or some recordings and think, actually, that's the sound that I want to make. Uh, or they're interested in it uh, intellectually. Uh, there are all sorts of different routes, but having done an enormous number of concerts and recordings and tours of myself over the course of my musical life, I re I've sort of got to that stage where I now want to discuss that musical life with the next generation. So working with um, students, actually, the earliest, the youngest ones I work with on the whole are at Cambridge University, the undergraduates there who are doing their first degree. At the Royal Academy of Music, most people are doing their master's degree, so are specialising more in historical performance. And then UBO and the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment Experience Scheme are a logical extension of that because that's the post-master's uh, professional development experience which they need, um, which UBO delivers like none other, not only on an artistic level, but on a very practical level as to whether or not people can survive on tour um, and how well they are prepared to be flexible to work with a group of people they haven't necessarily selected all themselves uh, and to make something creative and really inspiring um, out of scratch every year for a year and then disperse or to try and stay together and to keep on their connections and their relationships with each other and develop individually or collectively as performers. So basically you encourage them to experiment a lot, to play, to be part of orchestras, to see how other people do what they want to yes. do. Yes, and, and gone are the days where one was able to audition for an orchestra and get a job for life and then a pension at the end of it. That was never the case in the historically informed performance movement, but I think it's even less true now. Uh, it's a bit of a sort of buzzword, I don't know whether it's true over here, of a portfolio career. Most people do more than one thing now. Yes, I think it's uh, especially musicians. Yeah, especially musicians. It's also great fun to do that, as long as you don't spread yourself too thinly that you don't do anything well. Um, but to perform and to teach, to be the creative director of a group, to be interested in dealing with social media, um, of various sorts of networking, of creating websites or films, of developing new programming, of commissioning new works, of looking into even designing new instruments, new ways of presenting concerts, whether it's in a pub or a car park or a theater or a traditional concert hall, but in a different way with lighting, with scenery. There's, I mean, there's, there's still an awful lot to do. Um, by, we haven't run out of creative possibilities yet, that's for sure. And the cultural landscape at the moment, it's so diverse that you can find something to you do. You can find something and you have, to, you have to make something. And there is, there is a public out there who's interested. Um, the traditional 19th century concert hall model is possibly not the right place or the only place for certain sorts of music. And I think it's very exciting that younger generation, younger audiences are going for different sorts of things. A lot of young people are, of course, consuming their culture through headphones. Um, and we might resist that and say, well, what about live music? But in fact, what they're listening to often is a lot of our live performances 
unedited, slightly dangerous maybe live performances. Yeah. And there's, that's quite good, I think. So it might not be, for us, we might think, or we might think, well, it's mediated through some other medium, but actually a lot of people feel quite close to that. And we shouldn't forget that. Um, I love the night shift program we have with Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, where we do late night gigs in pubs. And people are always asking me, well, you know, surely people are drinking, making a lot of noise in pubs. Um, but the answer is no. If you present something that's intimate, you can hear a pin drop. It's often the quietest audiences I've ever, ever heard. And we've played a lot of very esoteric early 17th century or 17th century chamber music that I wouldn't be able to do in an ordinary concert hall because you create a sort of club atmosphere, a very special sort of social dynamic and conversation. And it's very exciting. So the connection, it's more intimate. Yes. Uh, more direct, more personal. So people don't feel that the process is mediated through this screen or this proscenium arch of the famous 19th century theatre where there are people performing and then there are spectators. So the social engagement between the, the, the audience are as important for the performers as the performers are for the audience. Because basically music nowadays is the soundtrack of our lives. Yes. So it's a way to make it more personal. Yes. Then. Yeah. And people are prepared to engage with that, which I absolutely agree with. It's fantastic. Margaret, it was a great pleasure to have you here with us and hope to see you again in, Bu in Bucharest and uh, to hear you play once more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Și eu vă mulțumesc că ați fost alături de noi. Eu sunt Radu Mihalache și vă aștept din nou la interviurile Festivalului de Muzică Veche București. Radio Clasic. Un radio în culori.